I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. Season 4, Episode 9 of the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Redcon One, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine. All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast, where we are talking about the 1990 Mr. Olympia. And today we have a special show. We're sort of deviating a little bit from the schedule. We were supposed to have Peter McGuff uh, Part 2, because we hit, talked to Peter last week. And uh, the interview was so long, we were going to make it two parts. But we're really going to talk to uh, Dan Solomon this week. So Dan is a special guest, and uh, we are going to talk about the movie Bigger, which is the movie about Joe Weider's life, Joe and Ben Weider's life. And uh, I was at the set in Birmingham, Alabama last month, and Dan invited me down there. And Dan is actually the co-producer of the movie. So Dan has had a very long uh, career in the bodybuilding field. He was the co-host of Pro Bodybuilding Weekly, which was actually the very first uh, show about bodybuilding. And um, this was before podcasts were popular and before social media was popular. So it was about 15 years ago when he did it with Bob Chicarillo. So uh, Dan has been in the industry for a very, very long time. He's one of the movers and shakers in the industry, you could say. So it was great to talk to him about his career. And uh, unfortunately, we got some bad news last week about the passing of Sean Perrine. And Sean was a uh, the editor in chief of Muscle and Fitness Magazine. And I've known Sean probably about 15 years because Sean created a, a website called IronAge.us. And it was started in the early 2000s, I believe around 2001 or so. And it was just a small group of people. And we all talked about the golden era of bodybuilding from the 1960s up to about the 1991 Mr. Olympia. That was the, uh, that was the space and time that we designated to talk about on that website. And again, this was, again, before social media, before Facebook. So if you wanted to interact with other people, you had to really go to the b different forums, the bodybuilding forums. And this was the one I was on almost every day. So Sean was the one who created that. And Sean was also a really great writer. And uh, he got the attention of Greg Merritt, who worked for Flex Magazine. And Greg brought his writings to Peter McGuff. And Peter got him signed up to work for Flex Magazine and Muscle and Fitness. And he moved out to California and he got to work with Joe Weider and he became friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he really lived the dream of a bodybuilder, especially an old school bodybuilder like myself or like Sean. And uh, he lived that life for many years. And then he moved out to New York. And uh, surprisingly, he had lung cancer, which I have no idea how he contacted that. He never smoked. He never drank. Uh, Sean was a total health nut. Always had around 5% body fat. He was always in great shape. Never took steroids. Uh, wasn't a big guy, probably five foot eight, five foot nine, about 165 pounds. But just a super genuine, nice guy. One of the really great guys in the bodybuilding community. And uh, by the time they found that he had lung cancer, it was too late. It was stage four. And uh, he found that out, I believe, on September 22nd. And then he just died last week, last Monday, which was the December 11th, I believe, or uh, the 10th. I'm not sure what day he actually passed away. So when I talked to Dan uh, on uh, Monday last week, uh, we were or Tuesday last week, we were pretty much blown away by this news because Dan was good friends with Sean Perrine also. So we ended up talking about Sean Perrine for uh, much of our interview. And then we talked a little bit about Dan's career and we also talked about the movie Bigger. So that episode or that interview, I should say, will be coming up in a second. But I do want to mention that we are brought to you by Redcon One. And at Redcon One, everybody wants to be a champion and everyone wants to be the best. And Redcon One, they believe working hard to achieve your goals. Whether you're killing it in the gym or running a six-minute mile, Redcon One has something for those willing to put in the work. They have a premier clinically dosed pre-workout called Total War that is the perfect companion to your workout to give you that extra push to break through your mental and physical barriers. And then after your workout, you can fuel your body with the revolutionary MRE, and that is the only whole food complete meal replacement with protein coming from salmon, chicken, beef, and eggs, and the carb sources coming from sweet potatoes and oats, and it also contains 10 grams of fat from MCT oil. It's the best tasting complete meal you will ever have. 
So go to redcon1.com and try the very best that sports nutrition has to offer. Redcon 1, the highest state of readiness. And because you are listening to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, you can enter the discount code LEGENDS at redcon1.com and you'll get 15% discount off of any order. And we're also brought to you by Old School Labs. I have been with Old School Labs now for several years. They are the supplement company that draws on the wisdom of the golden era of fitness and bodybuilding to offer unique supplements to the discerning athlete. Old School Labs is the only brand that I use, trust, and associate my name with. They are the brand that I used to win the Masters Natural Mr. Universe in 2012, as well as all the other photo shoots that I've done since then. And they are the company that sponsors Breon Ansley, who is the 2017 Classic Physique Olympia champion. They're also sponsoring Sergio Oliva Jr., who is getting ready for the Arnold Classic in 2018. And I just found out over the weekend, they're also sponsoring Samir Banut, 1983 Mr. Olympia. So go to oldschool.com and use the code LEGENDS12 and you'll receive a 12% off of any order. Old School Labs, supplements that make sense. Okay, we are winding down 2017 and uh, Christmas will be uh, one week from today. So I wish everybody out there listening to us a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays and uh, hope you all enjoy time with your family and friends if you get a chance to do that. Um, I will be heading out to Chicago this Friday and I'll be spending time with my family and friends out in Chicago. Everybody in my family still lives out there, my mom and dad and uh, my brother Don and my sister Kim and their families. So I will be heading out to Chicago this weekend and spending time with them, and I'll be coming back next week. So next week's show with Peter McGuff, part two, might be a couple days late because of the holiday, because the holiday will be on uh, Monday. Next Monday was is Christmas, and then, of course, the following week is the new year. So I uh, do want to mention I have a couple books out on Amazon.com, of course. I've been talking about this for the last few weeks, and they've been selling really well. Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends, Volume 1, is all about the golden era of bodybuilding in the 1970s. It's all about uh, the competitions that took place during that time, including all the battles that Arnold and uh, Sergio Oliva took place. And uh, it also has Frank Zane's very first Mr. Olympia win in there. And I talk about other bodybuilders like Danny Padilla and Tony Pearson and Cal Scalac. And I also have the 1980 Mr. Olympia, which is a two part, it's two chapters in the book. So I talk about all the stuff that went on during the 1980 Olympia including analyzing all the score sheets. And we have an, a special article in there about Sergio Oliva. So it's packed with great pictures. If you're an old school bodybuilding fan like myself, you will love this book. So I recommend you pick it up. It's at amazon.com. And I also have the MP6 workout book. And that is a, a new training system that I've been following for the last few years. And it involves uh, cycle training, periodization. So you have a six-week cycle that first that is involved with building your strength. And then after that cycle, you move on to another six-week cycle designed to build more muscle mass. So the idea is that the more strength you build, the more weight you can use in the mass building exercises for that six to eight or six to 10 rep muscle ra- or rep range. And that is what's going to build more muscle mass. So that is the whole idea behind the MP6 program. And like I said, I've been using it myself. For the last few years, I really enjoy it. It really gives my workouts uh, more motivation. I know exactly what I have to do when I go to the gym. I have it all written down. I know what weights I have to use, how many reps I have to do. And over that six-week cycle, it progressively gets harder and harder. So it's more of a challenge. And then after the six-week cycle is over, you have a light week, which I call a deload week, sort of decompress. Uh, Mentally, it's a big relief. And and physically, you just uh, go through very light workouts. And then you come back and you start the cycle again. So it's really a great system. I hope you guys get to try it out. And if you order uh, my MP6 workout book on Amazon, you can also order them directly from me. If you want an autographed copy, just email me at naturalolympia at gmail.com. And we can set that up if you want to pay by credit card or check or PayPal or however you want to do it. And also I'm offering uh, diet and training consultations too. I've been talking about that. I've been really busy doing that the last few months. I've been helping a lot of the guys out at powerhouse gym in tampa florida the powerhouse gym athletic club and uh, i've been helping a lot of people out online and i do follow-up programs where i follow up with you every week i either call you or email you and make sure 
that if you're trying to diet and get leaner, your waist is going down. And if it's not going down, then I will make changes to your program so you can keep making progress. That's the whole point of doing these programs with me is that you will make progress each week until you reach your goal. Same thing if you're trying to gain size and get bigger. We'll do the same thing. We do full body measurements every month. Uh, if you're not working with me out here in Tampa, I recommend that you take pictures of yourself every month and then we can compare them every four weeks and make sure you're making those progress. So if you're interested in that, just again, email me at naturalolympia at gmail.com. I'll send you out a questionnaire that you can fill out and I will be able to specifically write up a diet and training routine just for you. So it will work with the kind of foods you like to eat, uh, any injuries you have, uh, any specific goals you're trying to achieve. That's why I will customize the workout program for you. Uh, I also want to mention that we are brought to you by Florida Alternative Medicine. And in Florida Alternative Medicine, age is just a number. If you want to feel great, optimize your energy levels, burn fat, and balance your hormone levels to maximize your potential, then go see the experts at Florida Alternative Medicine and Weight Loss. They have a certified and knowledgeable staff that will work with you to achieve your goals and get you the results you've been looking for. They offer a wide range of services that ensure you will not only look and feel amazing, but also be comfortable knowing they're there for you every step of the way. They have very competitive pricing along with their quality products and services. So give them a call for more information and experience firsthand what sets them apart from the rest. You can also use the promotion code with them, LEGEND, and you will get a free consultation and 20% off all packages. So give Jeff a call at 813-922-8939. If you want to email them, you can email them at info at flalternativemeds.com. That's info at flalternativemeds.com. And again, that phone number is 813-922-8939. Tell them you heard the ad on Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and you'll get 20% off of anything you, you order and it'll also give you a free consultation. So that is the intro to our show. Again, have a Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. I hope you enjoy it with your family and friends. And here is our interview with Dan Solomon, where we're going to talk, unfortunately, about the passing of Sean Perrine and about Dan's career in the movie Bigger, which is the Joe Weider biopic coming out next year. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And I have a special guest on the line calling from uh, Boca Raton, Florida, my good friend, Dan Solomon, who was the host of uh, Pro Bodybuilding Weekly for many, many years. And he also did the play-by-play -play at the Olympia last year. And uh, we're here to talk about the movie Bigger, which is the new Joe Weider, Ben Weider biopic that they just finished filming out in Alabama. Dan, how you doing? John, it's good to be here. First of all, let me start by congratulating you. I know you guys have done a great job with this podcast, and I know it's building a ton of momentum. I, I've obviously followed your work for a long time. You and I go back a long ways, and uh, I know how passionate you are about the rich history of bodybuilding. So to see you take that passion and to turn it into this very successful production every week, I know a lot of people who, who are really close to the the history of bodybuilding. I know they follow you and have done so for a long time. So uh, congrats on all that you're doing and uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dan. I, and I've followed you for many, many years as well. I think we've all looked up to you as the epitome of what a broadcaster should be in the bodybuilding world when you did your Pro Bodybuilding Weekly show. You and Bob were one of the first ones to have a uh, weekly radio talk show, so to speak, on the body world. And uh, you guys sort of led the way for everybody. That started back in the summer of 2005, and, and, like, and you just nailed it. We were doing this uh, back before there was Twitter and Facebook and mm -hmm. back before there was uh, platforms like this one, um, back before, you know, just when podcasting was kind of becoming a word. And um, so yeah. we, decided, we decided that bodybuilding fans needed a place to, to get all the latest news on their favorite sports. So uh, Bob Chick and I, Bob Chickarello and I, we came together and uh, – we did this production, and uh, every Monday night at 8 o'clock, this was back when people used to listen to things in real time. The concept mm -hmm, of right. replay audiences was very different than it is today. Now, of course, everybody's got a podcast, or there's certainly a lot of them, and a lot of YouTube yeah. channels and a lot of different outlets. So the world, the game has changed quite a bit, but we enjoyed doing it back in those days because back then we knew that when we were reporting something, we were 
potentially the first people to get to do that. So it was a very different time. And um, we uh, we were always grateful that the fans embraced it. And uh, and I know you were always one of our biggest supporters. So we appreciate that. Yeah, you guys really led the way. Well, listen, we got a lot to talk about, but uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about our friend Sean Perrine, who passed away yesterday of, of all things, lung cancer at the young age of, I think he was only 51 years old. And of course, Sean was the editor-in-chief of uh, Muscle and Fitness Magazine, and both of us have known Sean for many, many years. In fact, I just did the wrap-up or the uh, beginning of my new show, which was which just aired yesterday, and I was talking about Sean's illness, and the next day when the show aired, he actually passed away. That was quite a shock, wasn't it, Dan? Uh, to say the least. We're still recovering from it. It was, uh, you know, Sean Perrine really the embodiment of all the things that we love about the bodybuilding and fitness community was all rolled up into him. You know, he is the guy that um, walked the walk and did it all for the right reasons. Um, always took mm-hmm. a very intelligent and healthy approach. So we thought right to all the things that um, he did in his life. Uh, really just a, a great physique, a highly intelligent guy, just, you know, exuded such a level of, of passion and, um, and, and high integrity and just a real high character guy. And he's somebody that, you know, like you, I've known him for a couple decades. And we both kind of came into this game together. Um, he uh, got a job as a sort of an entry level writer for Flex Magazine. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was actually discovered by a mutual friend of ours, Greg Merritt, who's also a very accomplished writer uh, in this industry. He's written books. He's also a, a senior level writer at, at the Weeder uh, publications. And he actually mm-hmm. saw, stumbled upon Sean Perrine, had a web, Sean had a website called Iron Age, which I know probably a lot of your listeners in particular are very familiar yeah. with. So Sean, yeah. Sean created this website and his writing was at such an unusually high level that when Greg Merritt, who was working for Flex Magazine at the time, when he stumbled upon um, Sean's uh, work, he immediately alerted Peter McGuff, the editor in chief and the boss of that magazine. He alerted Peter and um, said, "Peter, if you're looking for a great writer, this is somebody you might want to bring in." So uh, they gave Sean a job, and of course, the rest is history. He would end up um, one day climbing to the very top of his field, um, holding the same position that a couple of his mentors held. Um, one guy named Joe Weider, the other guy named Peter McGuff. Mm-hmm. Sean Perrine would mm-hmm. assume that spot. And, and would just do a brilliant job at it. But uh, on a personal note, it's a massive loss. Um, we've been very emotional this last 24 hours since we got wind of it. Uh, myself and Bob Ciccarello and Greg Merritt and uh, many of us were just so close to Sean and we were brothers. We really were. We, we had a real meaningful connection and it was just such a wonderful energy when we were all together. And it was always so pure and, and fun. And uh, it was one of the parts of going to an event that I know personally, I really looked forward to, and it was as close to family as you're going to get in this crazy circus of bodybuilding that we're all a part of. And and um, to lose Sean is a just a, a massive blow, and uh, and we're just so we're just so distraught about it. And, and I know, you know, for his family, I, I can't even imagine what they must be going through. I know he was very close with his mom, and um, and mm-hmm. it just it, it's just an indescribable um, loss. And like you said, far far too young. Yeah, I was a big fan of the Iron Age website, and I think that's how I met Sean. I think that's how I actually met Peter, because that was in the early 2000s. And again, this was before Facebook, before uh, where the only way you could really communicate with anybody was from the forums. And that website was specifically for old school bodybuilding. So it was a bunch of guys like me and older guys than myself. And we all talked about the days of Arnold and and that kind of thing. And uh, that's where we all bonded. And I'm a race to go on that website every day. So Sean was such a great guy and his writing, like you said, was so great. I mean, he talked about those old days of bodybuilding. I remember he wrote this series of articles about like if you were in Gold's gym when Arnold was training for the 74 Olympia or something like that. And it was a great series of articles and you really felt like you were there. So it was it was unbelievable that John, and it's uh, funny he passed away. John, and- on some level, John, you're you know, you're carrying on that tradition of yeah, what guys I was like thinking Peter about that McGuff- started and, and and we talked about I was talking to Bob Chicarello on the phone last night and we were talking about the important work that you're doing because 
guys like Sean Perrine and Peter McGuff and, you know, certainly, um, you know, others. And, you know, look, Peter's still around. He's still doing great work, and we still get to enjoy his words um, every week when he puts out a new article. But I'll tell you, um, not a lot of people are doing it, and not a lot of people are doing it the right way. Uh, and I know Sean would, you know, I know Sean was always very fond of, of you. And because, look, I always say, people are often quick to call me. They'll always say, yeah, Dan, you're like a historian. And I always say, you think I'm a historian. I got nothing on guys like Sean Perrine and Peter McGuff and John Hansen. And, you know, you guys just take it to a whole nother level because not only do you guys know as much or more than guys like I do, but you have this thirst to learn more and, and to sort of capture the essence of those days and to share it with, um, with your, you know, with your readers, with your listeners, through your books, through your podcasts, through your articles. And, uh, and I know Sean would just be so thrilled to know that, you know, somebody like you is, uh, is, is carrying it forward. And, and I hope you don't stop. I hope you continue doing it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Dan. Uh, yeah, I, I did get a chance to see Sean. He was actually just in Tampa about a year ago. Uh, they were shooting a photo shoot with Dave Batista at the, Tampa, at the powerhouse gym in Tampa where I train at. And uh, Sean was overseeing the shoot because he's the head of uh, Muscle and Fitness Magazine. And my friend Rich got to meet him, and he said they all hung out together at uh, Dave's house afterwards. And Sean was telling him, you know, because Rich didn't know, my friend Rich didn't know anybody really in the bodybuilding world. And Sean was telling him the story about how when he was a kid, he used to read Muscle Builder magazine. And he said, I want to run this magazine one day. And he said this as a kid. And then it's just crazy how that ended up happening. You know, how it all came to fruition. And he really did live oh, the dream, man. hanging out with Arnold, going to his birthday parties and interviewing all the stars that he read about. So. He and Arnold became like authentic friends. He and Arnold became yeah, real buddies. It, it was really cool for all of us because, you know, we all kind of came up doing all the same thing, just trying to get whatever interview we could get and, and all that. And, you know, Sean sort of made a name for himself. He used to write in his early stages of working for the Weeder magazine. Do you remember that section in Flex magazine called Hard Times, which was like the part of the magazine mm -hmm. where they would cover all like the – the industry stuff and the industry scoop. And that was the part of the magazine where we would all, when it would come out every month, we'd dart over to our local borders or Barnes and Nobles and we'd grab the magazine and we'd flip over to the hard time section, which was usually seven or eight pages. And that was where, you know, if you were doing something or if I was doing something or Kevin Lavroni right. or Sean Ray or Bob, you, that's where it would be. And so that really put Sean in a position to really build those relationships with lots of people. Um, that's how he and I became so close through those through those um, articles and, you know, I would do my best if I heard some inside scoop, I'd make sure Sean, you know, I provided it to Sean so he could cover it in the magazines. But, uh, you mm -hmm. know, when you talk about him building those friendships um, with guys like Dwayne Johnson and Arnold and, you know, John Cena and, you know, 50 Cent and all these guys, I mean, this was, they respected Sean because he listened more than he spoke. And, and I always say that's something we can yeah. all learn from. You know, hell, I could learn from that too. We all could, right? Um, guys like Sean would just had a, had a quiet confidence about themselves and people noticed it. And it made guys like Arnold want to be around him. And mm -hmm. he had a very meaningful connection with Arnold. And whenever I would see images of Sean, you know, on social media, hanging out with Arnold, there was times where I'd be in places and Arnold would be with us and, Look, he and Arnold were close. You know, I my my friendship with Arnold is far less than what Sean. Sean had a real connection with Arnold, so it was yeah. always very obvious to see that connection, and it was always really cool to observe it because I know how much that must have meant to Sean to get to a place where he was past all the, you know, the you know he he was past the state. He had graduated from being a fan to being a journalist to being a colleague. To, because they were both, you know, editors in in some way, shape, or form, and then all of a sudden now Sean is a a friend, and I know when the, a friend of Arnold's, and I know when when Sean's the the news of Sean's passing circulated, I know Arnold was one of the first people to take to social media and to yeah. voice his thoughts about Sean, and uh, the whole thing is just heartbreaking. But just knowing that Sean got to do the thing that millions probably aspire or dream of doing and and sean yeah. got to do it so his 51 years was was pretty well lived yeah i remember being on iron age and that was uh there was a point when he did get the job and he went over and then he started posting less and less on iron age but he was talking about how incredible it was to walk through the offices of joe weeder and 
to see all the, the sculptures and the statues and the posters. And you got to talk to Joe Weider. And then, yeah, like you said, I can't imagine how he must have felt having that f- close friendship with Arnold. Because we used to talk on Iron Age about Arnold. We were all fans. And we talked about him as a god, you know. So then Sean actually gets to hang out with him, go to his birthday parties, have dinner with him. And he really did live the dream. He sure did. Well, Dan, uh, let's switch topics and talk about uh, the Joe Weider story, the movie Bigger. And uh, you were kind enough to invite me out to Birmingham, Alabama a few weeks ago, and I got to see the part of the movie where they were filming the 1970 Mr. Olympia between the showdown between Arnold and Sergio Oliva, played by uh, Callum Van Moger and uh, Sergio Oliva Jr., which was really cool. So I got to see a whole day of filming, so thank you for inviting me out there. So tell our listeners uh, how that all came about. I know you were instrumental in getting the whole thing going. Well, um, for starters, it was great having you there. It really meant a lot because we were shooting a scene that day that was very specific to a time that I know somebody like yourself and the others who came out, the others from our bodybuilding industry who came out, we knew you guys really connect with it. Um, but I, I, I really got to tell you, um, all credit on this thing goes to executive producer Eric Weider, um, producer – uh, Steve Lee Jones, Scott Lestady, um, Camilo Castro. Those were the folks that really dug in and, and did the work. Um, Eric Weider um, was very um, skeptical early on about making a film about his, about his family. It was, uh, you know, he, look, let's face it. He, um, they're very protective of their privacy. They're also very mm-hmm. protective of their legacy. And um, Eric um, took this thing on. And, and I know that a lot of people have, you know, connected me to the project and and there's good reason and I'll, and I'll tell you that story in a minute but at the end of the day you know what eric the gift that eric weeder and steve jones collectively have given to the bodybuilding community I, I don't think the community will appreciate the gravity of that until they see this movie this is this movie is a very large scale production um to put some perspective it is the largest budgeted bodybuilding oriented production in the history of all time and wow. just to give some perspective, to give some perspective, the second largest project, this one's probably 10 times larger than it. I'm talking budget wise. This is a big yeah. deal. And, um, and again, what Eric and what Steve and, and, and company have done, they have brought Hollywood to this industry. Now, this is not as much as we are framing it as a bodybuilding movie. This is not a bodybuilding movie in that sense of the word. This is a movie about a couple guys, Joe and Ben Weider who were born into poverty in Montreal back in the 1920s and into the 30s and so on. And their story is incredible. It's a story that dealt with, you know, they had a mom who, Joe had a mom who really didn't really think much of him, to be honest with you. And Mm -hmm. these are personal accounts. And this is, and I should qualify this by telling you that a great writer named Mike Steer joined forces with Joe and Ben Weider to write that book, Brothers of Iron, which served as a major backbone to the screenplay of this movie. Um, so these accounts are, are very much, you know, through the eyes of Joe and, and Ben and, and a whole bunch of other resources that we tapped into. But um, what they had to endure as children, it was, it was more than anybody could imagine. Not to mention you throw in the anti-Semitism and all the other things that they dealt with. Um, and during a time when the world didn't even understand muscle, when athletes looked like Babe Ruth, and yeah. it was just a very different time then. So um, the story really taps into that journey and, and, and what they went through and his, his, his first marriage, which was a failed marriage, um, and the role that it played in his journey. Um, and then eventually he would go on and he would find that gorgeous pinup model from the 50s named Betty Brosnan, <laughs> who first became Betty Weider. And um, mm-hmm. and played brilliantly by you know Julianne Hough and, and you know the, the cast is terrific in this film and um, but yeah you know you, you you talk about who was behind this thing and uh, really you know Eric Weider and Steve Jones what they've done is is tremendous and uh, I think I think you guys are going to really enjoy it because I think it's going to go places that nobody's expecting um, it's far more compelling I think than people. This is not the story of how Joe Weider discovers Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's not what this movie is. Now, granted, right. the Arnold story is very much a part of Joe's story, and the movie does go there. As you mentioned, Colin Von Moger and you know, the others that were in the film. But the movie is so much larger. The story is so much greater than just a story of how you know, Joe discovers his, his 
you know, prodigy. Um, it was far greater than that. And um, yeah, I, I really think it's going to be something that the industry is going to be blown away by. Yeah, it is such a great story. I'm actually re rereading that book now, Brothers of Iron. And um, just to read about Joe's upbringing and the time they lived in in the 1930s when they were growing up in Canada and you know, the village they lived in and how his mother was and how he just followed this passion to start this magazine when, like you said, there was no no incentive for this at all. I mean, I, I started bodybuilding in 1977, and I can remember back then there was a lot of myths about bodybuilding. Everybody was telling me, don't do this thing. You're going to get fat when you get old because all that muscle turns to fat, and you're going to be muscle-bound, and it's like the worst thing you could ever do. So I could imagine how it was in the 1930s with you know Joe Weider trying to start this. There had to be no support at all, and to start this from nothing, and how he got the list of names, I think, from uh, Strength and Health magazine, and he was just sending out uh, postcards and how he bought these postcards for a penny a piece. It was just crazy how he just got started from nothing and made this huge enterprise that he did. And the film really captures it. I mean, there's a scene early on. It's one of my favorite scenes of the movie. It's such a simple, innocent little scene, but it's a scene where, and I'm not going to give away too much of the film, but I think this one's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Joe and Ben, as young men, probably in their 20s, are going down the streets of Montreal. And their goal is to see if they can get one of the, you know, the, one of the bubblegum shops, like those old bubblegum candy store type magazine yeah. shops, to carry their magazine. And um, they uh, uh, roll in there, and Joe goes up to the guy behind the counter, who's played by a terrific actor, and he ends up... Uh, he ends up uh, trying to pitch the, the store clerk to carry their magazine. And the store clerk looks at him, you know, Joe, this is the most ridiculous thing. Of course, he does it with this sort of Polish, um, French-Canadian hybrid type accent. <laughs> and it's just, it's done so beautifully. And he looks at Joe and he says, who would read something like this? Who would want to read this stuff? You know, what does this muscle do? It just so you look at the muscle, you touch the muscle, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> why do you, why would anybody care about shaping their bodies? And it was such a foreign thing. And the great part about that scene is it really demonstrated where the world was back then. Nobody thought about yeah. biceps and abs and sweeping quads. And that was such a Nobody foreign language. Yeah. Right. So this scene really captures how foreign the idea was so at one very powerful moment in the in the in that scene the clerk looks at joe and says who would ever read such a thing who would ever care about these things and then joe looks up and, and joe, the joe weeder character is played by a tremendous actor named tyler hecklin who's um very you know he's done very important um, roles over over his career um mm -hmm. and he looks up at the store clerk and when he was asked who would read these this type of thing he looks up and he says someday everyone and it's a it's a great scene. And as I was watching them shoot it, you know, you kind of get goosebumps watching it because obviously we know how the story ends. We know how the story plays out. Yeah, and just yeah. watching the in, the innocence and the resolve in that scene, and knowing where we were then back in the '30s and where we are today, and knowing that he had a 15 cent, 25 cent little pamphlet of a magazine that would eventually be the the siege that would grow to a really a billion dollar empire. A, publishing empire mm -hmm. that would sell for 350 million dollars one day and just it's a it's a really cool story and uh that's just an example of, of kind of the the things that this movie taps into yeah everybody loves rags of riches stories too and i think like you said this is a big hollywood production we have accomplished actors and directors and, and screenwriters involved in it it's not just some little made for tv movie that's going to disappear or go to cable right away or go to dvd uh so it's it is going to be a great story done uh, with top level talent. And uh, the last movie that they made about bodybuilding was, I, I believe, Stay Hungry, right? And that was filmed also in Birmingham, which I thought was pretty coincidental. Yeah, isn't that funny? Look, the, the state of Alabama yeah. and the city of Bur Birmingham, what a wonderful place. You know, it's one of those places that I never really thought much of. I never had been there. I don't think I'd ever even been to Alabama. And uh, yeah, we spent sure. a couple months out. We spent a couple months out there on and off. And I was only out there for, you know, you know less than half of it. But um, just got to know the people out there and the various locations were so well suited for this film because it's a very historic and preserved city. And there's just so many lo perfect locations that they were able to to use and uh, just a, a beautiful backdrop for the film. And by the way, the food in Birmingham is tremendous. If you ever have a chance to spend some time somewhere, um, man, go out there, boy, that's a, that's a good, it's a, it's a, it's an area that 
delivers far more than you would expect it to. Um, but we enjoyed being there. It was home to this movie for a couple months. And um, I know that um, that area has really become, um, I won't say a hotbed for movies, because I, I don't know that we're there yet. But uh, it's, it's a location that I think you're going to see more and more productions because they're very accommodating. And um, and I think as a you know as a municipality as a state they're trying to do things to tempt filmmakers to come into mm-hmm. that area. But uh, yeah, no, it was a good spot. Yeah, it's going to be an amazing movie. I mean, Joe Weider did change the world, and one of the things he did was he brought over Arnold Schwarzenegger. Without Joe Weider, we probably wouldn't have had an Arnold Schwarzenegger because if Arnold yeah, wouldn't have came to that. this country, he wouldn't have had all the opportunities that he turned into the life that he had. There's no doubt. And the cast was, was tremendous. I mentioned Tyler Hecklin plays Joe Weider, a, a very talented um, Welsh actor named Aaron Bernard plays Ben Weider. He's very acclaimed. He was just in a big time film called Dunkirk. He was one, yeah, of, the, I saw one that. of the leads mm-hmm. in that film. And Julianne Huff, of course, plays Betty Weider. And um, Tom Arnold's in the film. Colton Haynes is in the film. Victoria Justice, very popular among the younger crowd. She plays Joe's first wife, Robert Forrester, the iconic actor, a former Academy Award nominee. Um, he yeah. plays the older Joe in the final years of his life. Um, you know, uh, just a really, really a great cast. Steve Gutenberg's in the film, does a tremendous job as as Joe and Ben's father. Kevin Durand um, that does a great job playing basically the the villain character in this film. DJ Qualls is in this movie. Um, yeah, so it's a, and then of course Julianne Hoff is Betty Weider, and she was just wonderful and very professional and came all, mm-hmm. all of them really came that was one of the real surprises the pleasant surprises was you know I, a lot of times you, you you hear about actors and people that get paid a bunch of money to do things and you always wonder you know what it's like to see them do their craft and um i was just amazed especially with tyler hecklin and his portrayal of joe he came in and he was so prepared for all the minutia, all the nuances of Joe and his body language and the way he spoke. Everybody knows Joe had a very unusual speaking voice. Um, <laughs> right. Which almost, everybody imitates. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's funny because you know we have we had a, a they hired a, a dialect coach, and um, typically when somebody learns a language in a movie, it's a very specific category. It's either you know it's either Polish or it's French or it's German or whatever it is. Joe's accent really kind of fell into no category it was this weird sort of hybrid of all these things and it was an unusual sound and everybody tries to make fun of it and do it and it's i can't even do it without sounding like i'm doing the muppets i can't even do it but uh, some, it, it's, it's a very complicated accent to perform and um mm-hmm. and i know he spent a lot of time getting that down and uh the dialect coach did a great job and uh i think all told it's uh it's going to be um I, you know, I don't want to make any overwhelming promises for awards and all that stuff, but I, I can tell you that it's it's going to it's going to get a, a heck of a lot more respect than, than you'd imagine because the movie is very interwoven. There's a lot of depth to it. The performances are tremendous, and um, there's just going to be a lot to it. And uh, I'm just uh, I'm just really proud to have you know been able to have been a you know a, 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 I guess you could say a part of the process. Yeah, I just interviewed uh, Peter McGuff for the show, and he said the person that does the best Joe Weider imitation is Samir Benut. He said he can do Joe and Ben Weider having a conversation with each other. <laughs> That's right. Samir does a great, a great, you know, speaking of impersonations, I hate to circle back, and but one, in my opinion, the best impersonation ever in this industry was mm-hmm. our now late friend Sean Perrine's impersonation of Lou Ferrigno. Uh, it oh, was really? so it was uncanny how accurate and how spot on it was. Whenever I'd see him, I would <laughs> beg him to do Lou for me because it was <laughs> tremendous. You know, he just, he had all of it down and there's times where he would call me up and he would do it and it could have been Lou calling. It was that good. Um, but wow. uh, yeah, Samir did a great, did a great job. Everybody, uh, everybody thinks their Joe's the best, right? Um, I know mine is not. But uh, some people are really uh, do do a really good job. But uh, and, and, and it's one of the tricky things about a movie like this is you don't want to sound like you're impersonating somebody. Like even Colin, you yeah. don't want to sound like you're doing an Arnold impersonation. So um, he also deserves a lot of credit. He spent a lot of time working on that, and um, he I mean he visually he's an uncanny resemblance to the younger Arnold. It's it's actually to the yeah, point he was. where he would, 
I thought you were there. You saw it. I mean, wasn't wasn't there moments where you would look at it and him being on the stage yeah. with Sergio Oliva? It was, it was surreal, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, he's playing uh, Arnold from 1970, so he's 23 years old. And, uh, yeah, he just had that young look about him. They made his hair look like the Arnold of back then. And, yeah, he was a perfect guy to play Arnold. I can't imagine anyone playing a better, younger Arnold, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was, it was a fun thing in, to watch it come together. Now they're in post production out in LA, and they're doing the things that uh, they need to do to get this thing ready. And you know, we're looking at maybe some film festivals in the uh, in the spring, and wow. uh, shooting for a theatrical release over the summer. But of course, all those announcements uh, they'll, they'll come from Beholder Productions and Steve Jones Production Company, and you know Eric Weeder. So we'll have those announcements, you know, hopefully in the. Uh, in the next month or two as far as release. Everybody always, that's always the first question everybody asks is when's the movie going to be out? So yeah, hopefully we'll yeah. be able to pass that along to you and, and to your listeners uh, as soon as we know. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, speaking of Arnold, let's talk about Arnold a little bit because you were one of the few radio hosts or, or bodybuilding uh, hosts that had a chance to interview Arnold on several occasions. So tell us uh, your feeling about that, Dan. That had to be an amazing experience first time you did that. Yeah, it was, man. I'll tell you, I'll never forget the day. I think you know, this goes back a dozen or so years when Peter McGuff, who is friends with Arnold and mm -hmm. um, at the time was running Flex Magazine, he called me up and he was always, Peter's always been very kind to me and he's always been a really loyal advocate for, for the stuff that I do and I've always been, I'll always be grateful for that. And he called me up one day and he said, um, I have... Um, if you can be ready at such and such time, I can I can get you Governor Schwarzenegger. He was the governor at the time, and um, okay. which made, which added so many layers of com complexity to it because there was a million other gatekeepers and they, they oh yeah. my god it was an exhausting process. It's gotten a lot easier now, but back in those days when he had just become governor, um, it was very very calculated and careful, and all the media was very controlled. So he um, we we ended up doing the interview and uh, Bob Chicarello and myself, and it was you know the first time we had ever interviewed Arnold. And I remember during those few minutes where we hadn't started recording yet, um, Bob had just had his um, first or his first and his only uh, child, Melania, had just been born. Um, and, I and I only remember that because, and I always tell this story, I only remember that because when Arnold came on, Bob informed Arnold that his daughter had just been born in the Maria Shriver um, section of the hospital. Um, mm. <laughs> and I guess Maria had made a donation. So at that time, of course, uh, Arnold and Maria were, I guess, happily married. That unfortunately mm -hmm. did not sustain. But um, I remember that. So he, we had some laughs about that. And um, Bob and I had just both become fathers, like in the prior couple months. Both of us became fathers within like a two month period of time. Oh, and wow. um, yeah, so, you know, Bob and I have been through a lot. But that was a very exciting um, time. Um, and to have Arnold and then it kind of started a trend of trust, you know, in this industry, it's all about building trust. John, it's the reason why you're able to get all these interviews because people trust you. And, and it's the reason why, you know, we've been fortunate enough to get to work with Arnold, you know, a dozen or two times over the course of the mm -hmm. years, whether it's been on webcasts or doing radio interviews, he's always been very comfortable and, um, we're proud of that connection. And, um, yeah, but very nerve wracking. Nowhere gets real nerve wracking is when you do the webcast because then, Arnold's right. Now you're on video. So now you're on camera. So Arnold's right next to you. And as you know, when you interview somebody, there's a very narrow space, right? Like you're not, yeah. you're, you're in an you're uncomfortably close to the person you're talking to. I mean, you, you might right. be three, your chin might be three and a half inches from their chin. So right. I'll never forget the first, I'll never forget the first time um, we're backstage in Columbus and Arnold gets thrown right in front of me and I'm standing there and Bob is probably on the opposite side. And um, I'm just sitting there and all of a sudden we start, you know, we had like a minute to count in for Arnold. And all of a sudden, the, arguably one of the most famous men in the world is standing four inches from me. And I have the microphone <laughs> up and I got to be honest with you, I, I did everything that I could to sort of prevent myself from getting real nervous and shaken. But um, we did the interview and uh, it was fun and cool. And he joked with us beforehand and um, he had really good handlers because he's always, whenever he walks over, he always knows us by name. And you know, to this day, I always wonder if it's just because they tell him before he walks yeah, over. I don't know. Right, but right. but he, he's good at faking it. I mean, whenever he walks over, I always think I'm his best friend because he always, you know, <laughs> hey, Dan, good to see you. You know, so he's very good yeah. like that. But he, uh, but doing those interviews um, is, is really cool. And um, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a lot of fun. We've gotten to ask him some pretty interesting questions. We try to mix it up um, whenever mm-hmm. we do. I know there was one. I know there was one time where he had just reported, he just finished being governor, and he had reported that his time at governor, his time being governor, cost him something like two hundred million dollars of his net worth because of you know when he wow. added up projects, projects that he had turned down, and all the variables yeah. that came with being governor, the income that he had to walk away from. Um, he figured costing between 150 and 200 million dollars. So the first thing that I asked him, I said, Arnold, I have to tell you, I really can't thank you enough because you know you you just finished being governor and you lost 150, 200 million dollars, but you still come back here to Columbus each and every year and you give away a bunch of money and you still stay true to your roots as a body as a you know as a as a bodybuilder. And um, he that kind of caught him off guard because it forced him to address <laughs> that. And yeah. um, and he had. Of course, he handled it like a pro. Um, he responded beautifully. But, um, yeah, so it's uh, it's always cool interviewing the Oak. Yeah. I remember reading an article by Peter, and uh, he said, I think he interviewed Arnold when he was also uh, as working as a governor. And uh, he said they had an allotted time because Arnold was so bit busy. And they started talking about the old days, about when he beat Sergio Oliva for the Mr. Olympia. And he started going on and on about Sergio and how great he was. And then their time was up, and uh, he – he delayed it. He said, no, no, I want to keep talking. And Peter said, when he starts talking about bodybuilding, he loves it so much. He can't stop talking about it. And I, I believe that just from seeing him at the Arnold classic, when he does his seminars and Bob's asking him about the old days. I remember again, Sergio Oliva soon after he died, I think it was the year after he died. And Arnold just, he talked for about a half hour, 45 minutes about how great Sergio was, you know, you could, so you could tell he really is a bodybuilder at heart and he really does love the sport. Oh yeah, he does. It's, it's so authentic. It really is. He loves yeah. talking because I think I think in his world he's forced to talk about so many things all the time. He's mm-hmm. these heavy topics. He's gotten himself into the environment and he's doing a great job advocating for that. And I know back yeah. during that time he was forced to talk about mm-hmm. all sorts. Look, when you're in politics and you become governor, it's not all just the fun topics that you get to talk about. There's like the real tedious you know, local and, you know, you know, the, 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 the legislative matters that they have to talk about and things that aren't always really exciting. So you're forced to have to vote on things and rule on things and, you know, govern matters that aren't really that interesting, to be honest. And so yeah. all of a sudden he gets a chance to talk about, you know, his rivalries with, you know, Sergio and his, his, you know, his time out there at Gold's Venice and, those days, are you kidding? He lives for that stuff. And, and fortunately, he still does, you know, as evidenced by the fact that he's got Arnold Classics all over the world and he gets on yeah. airplanes and he flies 15, 20 hours a pop to be at every one of them. And for a guy who makes the money that he makes in other areas um, and, and a guy who could do anything that he wants to with his time, the fact that at this point in his life, he's still flying around the world going to bodybuilding contests, even though it's making him money. But let me be honest with you. It's not making him as much money as he could be making if he were doing other things. So right, right. Um, I, I think that kind of sums it up when it comes to Arnold. Yeah, I think he's one of the most fascinating human beings ever, really. I do. I'm not just as in the bodybuilding world, but I've read many books about Arnold. I know a lot about his life and just the way he's conducted his life, just the way his mental attitude has been, the way he's approached things, you know, when he first got into acting the way he marketed himself. He's just absolutely fascinating. Uh, let's oh, yeah. talk also about some of the other Mr. Olympias, because uh, you mentioned, Dan, that you're probably the few people that's interviewed all 13 Mr. Olympia winners. Yeah, that's something that um, <laughs> it's something that we're pretty <laughs> proud of, you know, because yeah, you obviously be. can't, if you haven't done it now, you can't do it anymore, right? So, no, uh, no. yeah, we, in fact, um, we had interviewed everyone except the one guy that we hadn't interviewed was Sergio Oliva. And mm-hmm. um, we, um, and, 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 and I, I made the mistake of telling Sergio that. And so he knew he <laughs> held the card. He knew he held the card. Yeah. So what, interviewing Sergio Oliva, even though it was a really cool interview, because we talked about some heavy things. Um, as you know, Sergio's story is something else. And um, yeah. because I know, I know you've written about it. <laughs> Yeah, you've written yeah. about it, you know, more than anybody. So, but it was, um, but I, well, Sergio knew that I needed to interview him in order to stand tall as having been one of the only, I don't know, I don't know how many who other people have done it, but having interviewed every single Mr. Olympia winner over the course of the time. So, um, 
he wasn't easy about it. I'm not going to lie. He made it really hard. He, it was <clears throat> difficult. And I won't tell you all the nuances of the story, but it wasn't an easy thing to put together. And we finally did. And um, it actually, through that interview, um, that was back before Sergio Jr. was even really, you know, anything on the bodybuilding yeah. radar. But um, right. it actually, it forced me into a friendship um, with Sergio Jr. Um, that we enjoy um, to this day. Sergio and I are pretty close. And a lot of it mm -hmm. was born through that interview because that interview, unfortunately, I was forced to go to some places with regards to questions that I think made the family a little uncomfortable. In hindsight, you know, I look back on that interview and I, I probably maybe could have been a little bit more sensitive, but I, he had just come out with a book and he wrote a lot of pretty powerful things in that book about, you know, the, you know, the story with, you know, the, the mom and the, you know, the gunshot and all that other crazy stuff that went on. And that was stuff yeah. that he wrote in his book. So we, we mm. tackled it in the interview and it made for a great interview. Unfortunately, you know, as with any interview, there's always a personal side and there's a family side and they probably didn't want to hear all that stuff. You know, whether even though it was in his book and I felt that it was in his book, it was fair play, um, you know, for them to hear it and to hear him talk about it, um, I don't think made them very happy. And um, Sergio, to his credit, was very honest about it. And we talked about it. And um, but it was through that that we actually formed a, a nice friendship. And um, of course, now his star is just blown up because he's uh, he's an yeah. impressive bodybuilder. Right. Yeah. But that's uh, that's the Sergio Oliva story. And yeah, so we are proud to have uh, been able to interview all 13 uh, of the Olympia champions. How was it interviewing uh, Frank Zane? Because Frank was always a very intellectual bodybuilder, uh, put a lot of thought into his physique, and he really created a whole new, whole new type of physique in an era when uh, they were just looking more for the mass monsters, and he sort of followed his own path. So that had to be interesting talking to him. It, it, it actually became, it was one of our more colorful exchanges because <clears> the way we set that up was, I don't remember who we had on first, Zane or Colombo, but I do know that we had Zane on, and Zane said something that pissed off Franco. So Franco, through his representatives, reached out to me and said, I want to be on next week. So Franco came <laughs> on, and he fired back at Zane. And then I think, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't remember how it went, but we, it started this two or three week in a row, back and forth, where these guys were just firing shots, and it was so entertaining, and it was so fun. It they was. Were, they, I remember they that. They didn't like each other. You remember that? Right, um, right. Yeah, they didn't like each other at all. But um, I don't know if they like each other to this day. I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> I, do, I do know that um, the, the Zane, Franco, back and forth was some of that. That's the kind of stuff that we just don't get anymore, man. And that's one of the reasons why no, no. I, I, kind of, I pulled away from it a little bit. Because, you know, now it's become very trendy to be humble and diplomatic and mm -hmm. respectful, which, by the way, humility and respect is a beautiful thing. And I love seeing it. But sometimes you just want people to have a little fun and, yeah. you know, throw, throw it out there and, you know, call somebody out a little bit. Let's face it. Bodybuilding is not the most, like, we all love it for our own various reasons, but it's not the most exciting thing to watch. And, right. you know, we, you know, we admire the dedication. We envy the passion. We connect to the lifestyle, all that stuff. And that's why it's important. But, it's look, watching a bodybuilding show or listening to bodybuilders is not always the most interesting or exciting thing. So we kind of count on them. And I wish they would kind of stir it up a little bit, create more storylines and help us help them promote their sport. But these right. guys won't do it, man. They just, you know, they all love each other and respect each other. And it's all great. And it's all <laughs> warm and fuzzy, but it doesn't really help with uh, creating interest. So that's just kind of where we've headed, I guess. Yeah, talking about Arnold and Sergio, I remember they used to go at it all the time in the magazines. And I remember, um, I think it was after Arnold first competed with Sergio in the 70 Olympia or 69. And there was no other American bodybuilders in there, except I think Reg Lewis was in there. And he, he wrote an article in Muscle Builders saying, calling American bodybuilders chicken bodybuilders, because they were afraid to go up against Sergio. And he was the only one who had the guts to go up against Sergio. And so he used to like antagonize people with you know, articles like that and coming out and being totally outrageous, which Arnold was known to do back in the day. And uh, you're right. It made the sport a lot more exciting because then when you got to the contest and I was talking to Peter about this, you know, back in the day, of course, there was no Internet. We only got our information from the magazines. So 
when we got to the contest, we were everyone was excited because it was the only time of the year you get to see these guys. And all the stuff that was written in the magazines was the buildup for that big event, which was the Mr. Olympia. So, you know, that played a lot into it, you know, the articles and the things that those guys said to each other. And it was all part of the drama. Well, it's funny you say that because back in those days before social media, um, as a writer, when you wrote something and your pen was on the paper or your fingers were on the keyboard, you mm-hmm. felt empowered like you were doing something really important right you're writing an article and that the world is going to use this this is going to be the vehicle by which they learn about the event or that they learn yeah. about the story and it was or even when we would do our you know pro bodybuilding weekly shows on Monday nights when words would come out of our mouths that was you know that was oftentimes how people would hear that so and so's not doing the olympia this year or so and so got hurt or so and so got arrested or so and so you know this that and the other or whatever it was or some trash talk that was that was how the that's how the uh, listeners and the fans consumed that information so when you were doing right. it you felt this real heightened sense of importance and it was a, it was exciting and it was a big rush now when you do stuff you just don't feel that way anymore. I mean, what you're doing here, it's, it's important because people like to listen to, they want to be kept amused. And I'm sure there's people on the subway heading to work right now that are listening to this or they're doing their cardio <laughs> and they're listening to this or they're at their desk and they got their headsets on and they're listening to this. So it does provide an important service, but it's not what it used to be in terms of connecting with people. And I always say, if I could push a button and make social media go away, um, I would push that button. People would people say that I'm crazy because they say that there's a lot of benefits. There's a lot of e-commerce value in social media. There's a lot of, I get it. People have made millions of dollars off of becoming Insta celebrities or whatever they call those things. And that's all great. But I don't know, man. I'm just from a different place. And I just love the way it used to be. And I guess that's, I'm just, I'm old school that way. I, I just, I just miss the old, the old way of doing things. And, um, I missed an era of higher integrity media, uh, you know, a time yeah. when you'd have to you'd have to earn your stripes and earn the trust of people. And I just love that time. I thought that was an important time. And now anybody with an Instagram account, you know, anybody can mm-hmm. start a start a show or start this or do that. And it's just I don't know. It just doesn't have the same feeling for me anymore. But um, so you kind of have to reinvent yourself, I guess, and come up with uh, new ways to uh new ways to you know provide value because back in those days it was just completely different and i'm not gonna lie yeah. to you i really i really do miss it i do too I, I miss the magazines i miss the in-depth stories i miss the excitement that was felt back then so i agree with you. i'd push that button too uh dan let's also let's talk about some of the co-hosts you've had over the years because you've been in this game for so long you said you had like about 25 different co-hosts for bob chicarilla but you've had many many others so Talk about some of your uh, memories with those those different co-hosts. Yeah, over over the years, you know, this all started for me back in 2002. Um, I think it was 2002. A company called Physical TV, which was a production company run by a guy named Richard Enlo, and um, I don't know whatever came of him, but they uh, they put on the Mr. Olympia for pay per view on television, pay per view mm-hmm. like the old school pay per view, like same way you were watching. I remember TV that. TV. Yeah, and um, they yeah. put it on and. Um, yeah, they were looking for somebody to host it, and um, Richard and I had a mutual friend at the time. Uh, her name was Kelly Ryan, and Kelly Ryan, you know, obviously <laughs> everybody knows Kelly's story and you know, how it turned out, unfortunately, um, for right. her and, and you know, for everybody involved. But um, Kelly introduced Richard and I, and Richard ended up uh, making me a host or a co-host, uh, and I, I think that year I – I don't, I don't even I don't even think I, – I wasn't the lead host. I was just kind of figuring it out at that time, and um, – well, I think I was working with like Vicky Gates doing some of the stuff on the women's side. And, and then, you know, we brought in Kim Lyons and Kevin Leroy and Sean Ray and um, Gunther Schlierkamp and Charles Glass. And I'm just going off the wow. top of my head. Um, yeah. I mean, oh yeah, we, it was just so, so many Dick King Kamali and of course, Bob <laughs> Chick. And these mm-hmm. are all people that over, and, I'm, and I know I'm forgetting a lot, um, uh, you know, worked with, of course, Sean Perrine and, um, you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, I, I feel like I'm forgetting people and you know, people are going to get upset. But um, there was um, a lot of co-hosts and they all do something different. Um, and I, I enjoyed, um, I've always enjoyed the opportunity to sit in there and kind of pick the brains of these guys because they're the experts, right? I'm just the person that would sort of lead, yeah. the, lead the 
Telecaster. And um, but uh, no, that was always a real thrill. But the, you know, the two guys, you know, for me who I still say that um, are just the very top of the food chain on that front are Bob Ciccarello and Sean Ray. Um, those guys, mm-hmm. they finish my sentences. They're very, very good at what they do. Not everybody loves what Sean has to say. Not everybody loves mm-hmm. what Bob always has to say. And some people, you know, they want to shake Bob or shake Sean or probably more so Sean than Bob. I don't know. But um, these yeah. guys, you know, Sean knows how to push buttons. And But love them or hate them, um, I will tell you they're both very talented at what they do. And I always yeah. tell people, don't don't be so quick to criticize what they do. It's very, it's not easy what they do, especially in an industry where we all know each other. That's what makes it so tricky. Um, I, I, I've been in the broadcast booth with Sean Ray, where like some competitor's wife has texted him and chewed him out after he said something about their <laughs> husband or boyfriend's physique that they didn't feel was flattering or fair. Um, right. And, you know, these things happen in our in our industry because we all know each other. We all go to dinner together after the event or we know each other for our families know each other. And um, it's uh, it's not the easiest thing to um, to make everybody happy and to still provide some objective analysis. Uh, listeners and fans, they like to call you a hater if you say something. But look, at yeah. the end of the day, you just call it how you see it and let the chips fall where they may. And if people feel like you have a personal agenda Look, you can't control that. That's what people are going to think. Um, but I've always enjoyed the chance to work. But those are the two guys. That, and you know what's funny? Another person that deserves a lot of respect in this field is Lonnie Teeper. Now, strangely, I've known Lonnie for you know 20 plus years. But I will tell you this. I've never worked with Lonnie. Lonnie and I have never co-hosted anything together, which is really strange because I know Lonnie's yeah. you know, like you there. He's a real historian. He's a very capable um, communicator. He's, a, you know, good at this stuff. He's really good at this stuff. And he, uh, he's somebody that I've never, I never got a chance, unfortunately, to work with just because he was always with Iron Man and I was working with Flex and then eventually with MD and, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, but love working with all of them. But, uh, you know, Bob and Sean, those are my guys. And um, anytime I get a chance to work with them, uh, Robin Chang um, was very kind to bring me out to the Olympia this year and mm-hmm. to let me um, co-host the, uh, the Olympia webcast for Amazon, for Amazon.com. And, uh, I got to do it with, uh, Sean Ray and my dear friend, right. Carla Sanchez, who, um, a lot of people know, I think the world of Carla and, um, it was fun. It's always fun getting to do that event. And, uh, I'm just really, uh, thankful to get to, uh, to be there for those events, especially this year when we had Dwayne, the rock Johnson there. And it was just a, yeah. a cool, a cool, exciting thing. But, uh, the Olympia, unfortunately, is where we kind of got wind that there might be trouble with Sean Perrine because Sean was supposed to be one of my co-hosts, or I was supposed to be one of his co-hosts, I guess uh, you could say. Okay. And um, yeah. he ended up not going to the Olympia because he was he fell ill, and um, yeah. that was when that's when we knew that there there might be some trouble. And um, yeah, but uh, no, the Olympia is a special weekend, and it's not going to be the same. I'll tell you, with uh, without. Uh, without my brother Sean Perrine there because uh, he was such a big part of the experience. Yeah, he was there, I think, the year before, right, doing the play-by-play, I think, with Dennis James. Yep, yeah, he when did it with Dennis Amazon, James. Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and he uh, and he, you know, he brought a lot to it. But, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't know that um, – I don't even know what that gig – I don't even I, I don't even know if that gig meant much to him. He did it, you know, as a out of respect yeah. to, to the company and out of the brand. You know, he's a, a very capable writer, probably one of the best writers I've ever known. Um, yeah, I agree. He was an, except, was an exceptional writer. Whenever we would think about great writers, it was always, you know, Sean's name would always come up. Um, in yeah. fact, I always said that one of the, even though I was so proud that he became editor-in-chief of Muscle and Fitness and Flex, uh, I often said that the only downside to that selfishly is I missed reading his stuff because when you yeah, become an yeah, editor, he about the articles. yeah, right, you stop writing and and that kind of pulled him away. And I actually really missed reading his articles when he became the boss of those magazines. Um, but uh, I guess that's just the nature of it, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with what you said about Sean Ray too, because we had Sean on the show a few times. I interviewed him about his career for my website, and uh, we just had him on the podcast because we were talking about the 1990 Olympia. And, uh, yeah, he's controversial and he speaks his mind, but I'll tell you, I had to agree with a lot of what he said, especially about the state of the sport today and where it's gone, you know, from, um, I replayed this, uh, 
tape from uh, the 19, or no, I'm sorry, it was the 2001 Olympia press conference when he got into it with Wayne D'Amelio. I don't know if you remember that, where they were talking about the scorecards. And uh, I had the, the tape of that from the press conference. And a lot of the things he was saying back then came to fruition today, you know, about the different judging and how the judges judge. And it was pretty interesting to hear him talk about that. And uh, he was right on the money. And a lot of people don't agree with him when he says it. They think he's being self-serving. But he really was, uh, he did really make some good points. And, and Sean also is an historian of the sport. He follows it. He knows He knows who's come before him, you know, and he knows what's gone on before him. And and uh, he, he did make a lot of great points. You know, he is really, really well-spoken, too. He's a great guy to do an interview with or a, a commentary with. The, uh, you know, they always say sometimes the most, the, the, the most uncomfortable of things is the truth, right? And um, yeah. not everybody want, not everybody wants to hear it. And look, I'm not going to tell you I agree with everything Sean says. Sean has put some things out there where we've been sitting next to, you know, we've been sitting like in a broadcast booth doing an Olympia or an honor classic, and he'll say something, and, <laughs> you know, my, my left elbow will kind of nudge him, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You really just said that? <laughs> but um, that, that we, we've had those moments. I'm not going to lie. We've had those moments. But um, overall, you know, he's right more than he's wrong. I'll tell you that. Um, yeah. And, and such is the case with Bob as well. Bob is uh, is somebody who I always – enjoy working with and uh i'm glad we get to do you know we're going to start to get to do some more things um with some of the opportunities that are coming up but uh it was great seeing um bob in the film we were able to get bob in the film he got a little part yeah. of the commentator and he did a great right. job with, with tim wilkins and uh there's going to be a few little cameos that i think the bodybuilding fans are going to recognize this movie is going to be two completely different experiences you're going to have the bodybuilding fan who's going to love mm-hmm. the movie and hate the movie. And I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Bodybuilding fan is going to love the movie because they're going to see things come to life and they're going to see a story told in a way that it's really going to be personal for them. They're going to hate it because Bodybuilding fans know more than everybody else. And as you know, with a Hollywood film, there is creative license. And not every dot always connects. Not every storyline is always exactly as it happened. You know, there are... You know, this this story, this movie is inspired by actual events, as they say, right? So there are moments yeah. in the film where maybe that's not exactly the way that happened. Maybe that's not the way that guy met that guy. Or maybe in 1952, right. that guy wasn't really around yet. Maybe he was only around in 54. So there's going to be a couple spots that the savvy bodybuilding fan will pick up on. And I'm sure they will rub our noses in it and they will make a big deal out of it. And that's just the way it is. But then there's going to be the experience that the regular viewer, the regular moviegoer is going to see. And I think it's going to be far less critical because they're going to come in there with a far more casual perspective and they're not going to know everything. So um, this movie was made to be a commercial success. It was made to attract the largest possible audience. And unfortunately, the reality in doing that is that you're going to piss off a few of the really hardcore educated bodybuilding fans, maybe even guys like you, John, mm-hmm. who are going to say, hey, wait a second, that's not the way that happened. Um, but uh, right. I, I'll, give, I'll give the filmmakers credit. Um, they did. Andy Weiss um, wrote a, a great uh, screenplay with Brad Furman, and um, it was a, a beautiful film directed by the iconic, legendary George Gallo, who was the film's director. And George Gallo has mm-hmm. made very important films. Um, he's directed the likes of Robert De Niro, and he's, uh, he wrote the whole Bad Boys franchise, and he's done a lot of great big things. And um, yeah. so George you know, led the way, and they did a beautiful job telling the story. But uh, yeah, I'm bracing myself for that because – People are going to call out, <laughs> call out the movie because I know there's a couple spots that I even observed and I said, oh, maybe that's not quite. But you know what, though? It is what it is. And I think it's a fun, very entertaining movie. And of course, I'm biased, but I think you guys are going to like it. Yeah. Well, congratulations on putting it all, all together, Dan. I know you were the impetus that got it going. So congratulations on that. And I also want to mention that you have a website called digitalmuscle.com. So if uh, our listeners haven't checked that out, maybe be sure to check that out. You have Great content coming from there every week. And uh, I, I've contributed also to that uh, website on occasion. So uh, also congratulations on doing such a great job with that. Thanks, man. Yeah, digitalmuscle.com. We launched it about two years ago. Every single day, new content goes up. There's over a thousand articles and videos and whether it's nutrition and training and research and um, fit recipes and inspiration and um, you know, really uh, countless 
uh, supplement reviews and you know nutrition insight. There's just a ton of content. I have you know my man Dave Borlay out in Venice Beach, California. He's you know yeah. he's our senior producer. He's doing a great job. We have Muscle Beach TV and um, uh, five or six other series that really bring people close to the action at some of the most you know well-known gyms in the world. Um, and, um, you know, we're very fortunate to be supported by some great companies, uh, Redcon One, who I know also supports your show. Um, yeah. Aaron's been very supportive of what we're doing. Um, the folks, Joe Corbett and the crew over at House of Pain, um, my good friends over at uh, Wings of Strength, uh, you know, Jake and company, you know, and so forth. We have some great supporters, but the content is tremendous. And it's become, you know, it's become one of the top sites in the category. And we're really proud of it. Digitalmuscle.com is a site. If anybody wants to reach me for anything, you know, whether it's uh, you want to, you know, be looked at as a possible uh, content provider or you want to do something um, in, you know, you, know, you want to take advantage of any of the opportunities that are available through Digital Muscle, um, you can just shoot an email over to media at digitalmuscle.com. And um, whatever we can do um, to, um, you know, to hook you up, however we can, we'll, we'll do it. But uh, I know, John, you've also been – we have about 45 different content providers um, spanning wow. about, 20, about 22 amazing. different – yeah, about 22 different categories. You're one of them, John. We love your stuff. Um, your, congrats on your new book, by the way. Um, really, Thank really you. excited. I know that um, it's going to be a great Christmas gift for a lot of your listeners. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. And, uh, it's uh, it, it's pretty cool that uh, you continue to crank out great stuff like that. But yeah, digitalmuscle.com, guys, check it out. All right, Dan. Well, thank you for joining us. I know we were only going to talk for about a little bit of time for about the movie, but of course we got involved with other subjects. So uh, I know you're really busy, but thank you again, Dan Solomon, for joining us on the podcast. I'm glad I finally got a chance to get you on here. And uh, we look forward to maybe talking to you again, Dan, soon about another subject. Yeah. Thanks, John. And then, hey, all you guys out there, next time you're at the gym cranking out a force strap or doing anything, uh, think about our, our man, Sean Perrine, man. He, uh, he was, he, you know, he was such an important part of this community. And um, next time you're, uh, you're, you're training or you're, you know, you're working on your posing and j just think of Sean because he's, he's such a, he, he'll continue to inspire us in so many ways. And uh, we were just so proud to be a part of, to have him as a part of our lives. And, uh, just keep him in your thoughts, keep his family in your prayers, and uh, and John, keep up the good work. All right. Thank you. Well said. Thanks, Dan. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and thanks to Dan Solomon for joining us on his busy schedule. I want to thank Redcon One Old School Labs and Florida Alternative Medicine for sponsoring this episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and we will be back next week uh, on the week of Christmas. And we will have our second part of our interview with the great Peter McGuff, who was a writer for Flex Magazine, where we will talk again about the 1990 uh, Mr. Olympia contest. So join us next week. Have a great Christmas, everybody. Enjoy your holidays. And we will see you next week on the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Take care.